let's introduce the panel. Let's go out at the far end, Jimmy Baird, who uh, was with In Fury with Bobby Diamond. Next to Jimmy is Roger Mobley, who re I mean, who replaced Jimmy in, can you hear me here? Who replaced what? Jimmy in. When did that happen? Uh, <laughs> in the series, and of course, Bobby Diamond and Johnny West Westbrook from my friend Flicka. Washbrook, but that's close enough. What? <laughs> what did I say? Westbrook, Wash I'm sorry, Westbrook. I'm sorry. I did that, I did that once before, I believe, didn't I? <laughs> Before we start asking the questions, um, let's start at the far end with Jimmy, and let's see each one of you, let's come down and give us a very brief uh, outline of your career, how you got in the, in the show and what you did after uh, and what you're doing today. Start with Jimmy. I'm Jim Baird. Some of you think of me as Jimmy Baird. So did my mother. <laughs> Well, I started acting when I was five years old. I don't know why. That's a long time ago. Uh, my sister, my older sister, when she was eight, was a dancer. And the Eddie Colgate Comedy Hour wanted to use her as a dancer. So she had to get an agent. So at the age of five, I wanted an agent too. And I didn't sing or dance. So what else could you do? I acted. Uh, my sister went on to be one of the original Musketeers. Uh, I just continued getting acting gigs. Uh, from the time I was five until I was 19, I, I retired at the ripe old age of 19. Uh, and I just made a lot of the TV shows that were around then, uh, many of them westerns, like Have Gun, Will Travel, like Laramie, uh, Rawhide. Uh, I was even on My Friend Flicka once. <laughs> Good choice, Jim. <laughs> yeah, I thought like so. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I made about 25 movies. Some of them were B Westerns that I can't remember the titles of. That's Some of them even seemed like the same script, and I played the same little boy with a different name. <laughs> uh, I did live TV shows like Matinee Theater, I did radio programs with Jack Benny. Uh, you know, I. At the age of six, I was Natalie Wood's little brother in Rebel Without a Cause. Uh, I was in no business like show business, but I was five years old, Ethel Merman's uh, son. And I know Marilyn Monroe was in the movie, but I sure don't remember it. <laughs> uh, at 19, you know, that was, I, I did acting. I did it seriously, but not all that seriously. I guess that's why I got replaced. <laughs> uh, uh, but I knew I wanted to do other things as a career. Uh, at the age of 21, I started teaching high school, high school English in Carpinteria, California. And I taught in the same classroom there for 40 years. So that, that, wow. co that covers, you know, 1967 until 2007. I've been retired now for four years. Uh, Married in 1966, my wife's sitting in the front corner over there. What language? And we've been married for 44 years. And uh, we'll go for another 44, I think. That's, that's an accomplishment in itself. What, what language? What language you what? Said, you said you taught language. English. <laughs> <laughs> what other language is there? Yeah, that pretty well sums me up. You can ask me more questions later. That's enough for now. Let some others have a go. Okay, Roger, if you would fill us in a little bit and please tell us about Gallagher while you're doing okay. that so we'll, everybody will be aware. First of all, I really appreciate being here and I appreciate the invitation. And uh, to set the record straight, my name has always been Roger Mobley. And uh, I sang in a, a little Western trio with my older brother and sister, the Little Mobley Trio. And we moved to uh, California when I was six or seven. And we got on the Ted Mack Amateur Hour when he came from Chicago at, on the, Mou at the Moulin Rouge. And uh, sang Blue Suede Shoes, and I think we came in last. <laughs> but um, an agent by the name of Lola Moore saw the program and contacted us through uh, that company. And she sent me on uh, an interview for the Fury Show. 
And this is a show that I had been watching before we moved to California from Texas. And uh, lo and behold, I got the part of Packy. And um, it's interesting. I never could understand why Ray Nazaro treated me so bad. I found out much later from Mark Bennett, one of the producer's grandsons, that Ray Nazaro wanted Jay North for the role of Packy. And uh, Leon Fromkus and Mark Bennett wanted me, and they won. And so I, I don't think Ray ever took that uh, real well. But anyway, Jay North, it worked out pretty good for him. He became Dennis the Menace. And um, so after the Fury show ended, I, I was like Jimmy. I just worked on a bunch of uh, TV westerns and what have you. Uh, my dad says it was like 70-something, I don't know, and a few uh, feature films. And when I was uh, 14, uh, the Walt Disney folks hired me to go to Germany and do a film called Emil and the Detectives. And uh, from there, when we came back, uh, Walt Disney had a serial in mind that he wanted to do called Gallagher, but uh, he hadn't found the right kid for it. And he was watching uh, Emil and the Detectives, and he told his son-in-law, Ron Miller, he said, I think we've found Gallagher. So uh, I got to be Gallagher for, I think it was four years on The Wonderful World of Color. And um, I was doing a dragnet one time when I was 18, and I got my draft notice. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got drafted in the Army, and once I was there, I re-enlisted to go to a Special Forces school. And uh, I served in the Green Berets for uh, two years, seven months, 12 days, 10 hours, and 35 minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, when I got back from Vietnam in November of 70, uh, my wife and I, uh, moved back to Texas, and my wife's in the audience. Her name's Sherry. Uh, I always tell people I married an 18-year-old, and I win a lot of bets with that, but I don't tell them I married her 43 years ago. Sherry, would you stand, please? I went to regular high school because Walt Disney worked out a thing with me that they just worked during the summer so I could go to high school and play sports. And um, she was my, wasn't my high school sweetheart because she wouldn't have anything to do with me. But an hour, uh, a year after we graduated, uh, she conceded to go out with me, and that was all she wrote. <laughs> but um, when I got back from Vietnam, we moved to Texas, and uh, I served on the police department in Beaumont for several years. I did three years as an undercover narcotics officer, and uh, just I've had a plethora of <coughs> career changes. And the last and most exciting was was. Uh, for about six years, I toured the country and climbed and inspected wind turbines. And uh, so I guess that's about it. I really appreciate being here. Thank you. Bob, you want to pick up? Oh, I can't compete with that. <laughs> <laughs> See, when, when did I start? I started before I can remember. I was uh, sitting on a porch someplace holding a, a hat with some ducks in it. And somebody came up and took a picture of it, ended up on the cover of a magazine. And then, uh, then he took another picture, and that ended up on the cover of a magazine. Then my mom got me an agent. Lo and behold, it was the same agent that he had, Lola Moore. At this time, Lola Moore, this big, heavy gal with a great big hat, and she handled all kids. There were no other agents. It was just this one woman. And when you went on an interview, you'd go and there'd be a hall filled with kids, I mean hundreds of kids going down the hall, and then this woman would come waddling down, it was Lola. And every year you'd get a little gift from Lola for Christmas. I mean, she had, the, later all the, uh, the mothers of the different kids slowly became agents. Don Grady's mother became agent, uh, the Grady Agency, and I forgot who else, there's a bunch of them. And uh, then, then I did a show, I think when I first started with uh, Extra Work, and I did a show, The Greatest Show on Earth, with Cecil B. DeMille directed, you know, a name out of the past. And uh, I forgot who else was in it. Some, some big stars in it. And, and there, was, there was a lot of stuff going on, and I was in the audience, and I came down, and my mom remembers me going down and pulling on Cecil B. DeMille's jacket. And he was talking to me, and I'm talking to him. And, and my mom was just so excited, thought I was really making a breakthrough here. <clears throat> Later she came up, she says, you were talking to Cecil B. DeMille. I mean, I didn't know who it was. I said, well, she said, what did you say to him? I said, well, I said, I saw these other people had popcorn, and I wanted some popcorn. So I went up to this guy and I said, hey, can I get some popcorn too? That was my conversation with Cecil B. DeMille, my big break-in. I used to go on interviews, my mom would afterwards say, 
well, what happened? I said, well, you know, I talked to them, they talked to me, and, and then they said, what have you done? And I said, and she says, well, what did you tell them? And I still haven't done anything. <laughs> so I didn't get the part. <laughs> I went on another interview, and after the whole interview, and 100 kids in the hall, she said, what happened? I said, well, I was talking to them, and they said, well, what did they say? I said, well, they asked me what I've done. I said, well, I haven't done anything. And I didn't get the part. <laughs> Next interview, she says, this time when they ask you what you've done, <laughs> Tell them you've done two Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis shows and a Dennis Day show. So when I went in, I came out and I got the role. <laughs> then, I, then I added that role to my list of Dean Martin, two Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis shows, a Dennis Day show, and <clears throat> that show. And then eventually I could drop the two Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis shows, and I finally started working. Then I got some bit parts with, oh, Young Man with Ideas with Glenn Ford and Americana with the... Glenn Ford. I just kept working with Glenn Ford. I couldn't get away from the guy. He actually remembered me. I did the Americana with these huge Brahma bulls, and, and he walked up and he says, didn't I work with you before? I had a little part where I did like a couple lines, and I said, yeah, me and Glenn were like this. <laughs> <laughs> then, then I just kept going in interviews, and the parts got a little bigger, and then finally I went out on Fury. See, when they talk about these two people, they talk about Roger taking the place of, of, uh, of Jimmy Baird. See, the point was, they were both being groomed to take my place. <laughs> so I just outlasted them, is all, because they figured I was going to get too big, and eventually they'd move the other guy in. So uh, Rod, uh, Jimmy was there for a couple years, and, and he went, then Roger came, and if the show had gone any longer, it would be Roger, Packy, but thank God, you know. Obviously, you never got too big. <laughs> they, didn't, they, didn't realize, they didn't realize that Roger was going to get as tall as he did. He's taller than me, so... <laughs> I remember they, thank God I didn't know the height of anything. They, they saw my mom was only about 5'2", and they asked me, how tall is your dad? And I said, oh, about 5'2", or 3", and he was actually about 5'9", but they wanted to make sure that you would stay small so that the show could go for a long period of time. And by asking that question, they figured the mother's 5'2", the father's 5'2", 3", the odds are he'll stay small for a length of time, because you don't want a kid that's six feet tall playing a little kid. What did I do after that? Then I did the Dobie Gillis show. I went, uh, you don't, re do you remember ever trying for that? Yeah. yeah, yeah, we were. They, they. How would we be yeah. up for the same part? I, that I was know. that was that was the point. <laughs> the point of this, I went out on a. Uh, they were going to replace Dobie Gillis, and they wanted to bring in a new character, and it was his cousin Dunkey. <clears throat> so I went out on the interview. At the time, I was a gymnast too. I competed in gymnastics for years, and was on a scholarship to Cal State University Northridge for gymnastics. Oh, this. Oh, I have to get this. It's his coach. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> somebody's somebody's pissed off, and they're calling me. <laughs> Somebody wants to, so so we went out and there was there was they had like a partnership on the Dobie Gillis show. There was Rod Amato was the director, a guy named uh, there was the creator and I forgot his name, the creator of it, and and one other guy, and and I was with the two, these two guys and they were talking to me and I was you know, I came off pretty well and they said you know I like him. They brought in Rod Amato who was a little guy. He's about five foot three or four, and shaved head. And this is a long time ago, and he came in. They said hey Bobby's really good and he came. He just walked in and said he's too old and walked out. So I said, well, I guess that's it. And I was in a chair, and I pushed myself up to a sit position, and I pressed to a handstand, and then I fell out and started to walk away. And they went, oh, God, that was great. That was great. And they said, show Rod, show Rod. They came out, and they, they said, come on in here. And they brought me to another office, and there was Rod Amato. He said, show him, show him, Bobby. So this time I, I went to what's called a planche. It's a push-up position. It's like a push-up position, but your feet aren't touching. You just hold yourself like that. So I kicked out into that and then pressed it up to a hand. I was really strong at this time. Pressed it up to a handstand, and then rolled out, and he says, that was pretty good. He says, you're still too old, and he walked out. <laughs> so then, then they had, so then they had, they, they filmed a, what do you call it when they film, what is it, the tryout? You know, they had a, where we all, we screen all, test. a screen test. And, and, here's, and here's Roger Mobley out on this, I'm 18, and he was about 12, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and, we're, and we're doing a role, oh, I guess I was 17 or 18, and we're doing a role like, God, look at that babe, is she hot? Whoa, God, I can really go for her, she's my kind of woman. Here, I'm reading those lines. Here's a 12-year-old reading these lines. I mean, they really don't know what they want, you know, because they got a 12-year-old, you know, because Dobie Gillis was always after women, always picking up on girls, picking up on women. And so I'm reading these lines, and here's this little, I said, so they were really confused about what age they wanted. So I ended up getting the role. Good shot, Rod. <laughs> and, and Rod Amato. Later, years later, I became an attorney, and I was in Westwood. 
And, uh, and Joel Kane was the guy. He was the producer. Guy Scarpita was another producer. There was the creator and then Rod Amato. And those four guys made the decisions about, and they kind of worked as a team even though they had different positions. Late, Rod Amato was married to, uh, who's the little, the little guy with the cigar, you know? Groucho? No, no, not Groucho, <laughs> no, no. The, George Burns. He married George Burns' daughter, you know, George and Gracie Allen. Uh, and he had, a, he had a strange attitude about men and women. He, when we were on the set, somebody would bring him a glass of coffee. It could only be given to him by a woman. He didn't want a glass of coffee being handed to him by a man. <laughs> so, so one day, I, and he was a strange little dude, but he, it was really, he was really kind of a neat guy, but strange. Yet I was in Westwood. You know, my office was at the Avco building in Westwood. And I saw, I saw Rod Amato walking down the street, kind of hail like a cab or something. I have no idea what he was doing. So I walked out there and I grabbed him by the shoulders and started throwing him around. He was a little guy and I was a little, you know, I'm a little bigger. I said, you're Rod Amato. You're the guy that was hitting on my woman. You can, he just, hey, hey, I don't try, hey, hey. You know, I said, hey, Rod, it's Bobby Diamond. How you doing? <laughs> I just freaked this poor little guy out in the middle of Westwood Boulevard. He's out in the middle of the street. So, so we just said hi and he, he says, crazy people. And he got his car and left, never saw the guy again. But. That was Rod Amateur. Then late, later when I, was, uh, when I was 16, I was in high school, my senior year, I got the Nana for Bray series. Nana for, I, I, there's, here, here's good news and bad news. You know, it's one of those stories that can go either way. I was up for two, it's, you're lucky to get a series in your life, let alone, you know, two series. I was offered my three sons and the Nana for Bray series at the same time. I had the part of Don Grady. <clears throat> And that, that was shot at Desi, I lived in the valley and you had to go over the hill at Hollywood. And Universal Studios was the Nanette for Bray show. It was the Westinghouse Playhouse, Nanette for Bray. They couldn't make up their mind. So, you know, so it was just a short jaunt. I was getting, they, they, and that was a the part where they, they liked me and then they said thanks and I left. And when I got to the gate at Universal Studios, they said, they want to see you back in the office again. I said, oh, okay. So I went back in. You know, I talked to them a little bit more. They couldn't make up their mind. They said, okay, thanks. And, and I walked out again, and I got to the gate. And the, they want to see you again. <laughs> so three times, then they finally offered me the role. But they offered, like, I don't know, like $50 a show more, you know, and, than, than my three sons. So we chose that show instead of my three sons. <laughs> we chose that show instead of. And, and I eventually worked on my three. That show went one year and got canceled. It was a great, it was a great time. Nana Fabray is really funny. More in person than she is on the stage. I mean, but in person, this woman's hysterical. I mean, you could sit there and just laugh. She tells stories about Sid Caesar and Imogene Coke and the, I forgot what show they, they were all on. And she would, she would choreograph their numbers and they would do it on stage and she would dance off stage while, and they would imitate her on stage. Oh, God, she's funny. And she would tell stories about, about, um, Oh, who's the famous dancer, the skinny famous dancer? The, the, Fred, Astaire. Fred Astaire. She would say Fred Astaire could never look at himself because he looked to himself like a chicken dancing, a skinny little chicken. So he could never watch himself, and he would rehearse and rehearse and rehearse to the point where, you know, I even used it in a closing argument one time, how, how immaculate Fred Astaire always wanted to be able to do a dance number from beginning to end without editing, without having to cut it. So he would do it until it was just perfect. But she worked with him. But then I eventually worked on My Three Sons. I did two shows. I did two shows, and one of them, I, two of them I was talking to Fred McMurray, and one show I actually was shaking hands with Fred McMurray. I've never met Fred McMurray, never seen the guy. He never worked on the show. He, he, he only did the show if he was allowed to only, he only says, I'll do a TV series, but I only want to work for three or four weeks a year. So they would shoot all the scenes around him, even if he was in the scene, he would just come in and do all his scenes and then leave. What a great gig. So that's why you never saw too much of Fred McMurray. But when I was on the, when I did the My Three Sons, everybody there knew that I had turned that role down and you know, would chuckle under their breath and point at me and laugh. <laughs> that show ended up being I, one of the longest running shows. I didn't know how long, it was like 13 years, or some crazy number of years that thing ran. But, you know. but then again, if I, if I had done that show, I went to school, I competed in gymnastics, I went to college, I was on the gymnastic team, I was in the NC2A two times, you know, and won, won awards in uh, rings. So I never would, and I went to law school. So if I'd have done my three sons, you know, I wouldn't have competed in high school and in college. And I would have missed him. And I'm, I got enough now. <laughs> I'm gonna let Johnny Washbrook take it from here. That's about all the time we have, yeah, folks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then, then I went to law school, became an attorney, and for 40 years I practiced law, and now I'm kind of semi-retired. I just do criminal defense. I just represent people like you. <laughs> 
You're right. <laughs> okay, Johnny, you take it. Well, uh, a, a curious, uh, interesting uh, experience I had just before coming into the room this morning. Uh, I was out there in the dealer room, and uh, I met Jim Baird's wife, Sharon Baird. And interestingly enough, uh, the high school, it turned out that uh, Bobby and, and Jim Baird and his wife, Sharon Baird, and I, w we didn't realize it, but we all went to the same high school back in uh, the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles. And uh, we didn't realize it. We're all like one year apart. And well, we in realized talking. it. We, we knew each other. We, yeah, school. Bobby and I were in high school together, and we were friends, and we hadn't seen each other uh, ever since high school until we went to uh, one of these festivals uh, last year in Winston-Salem. Uh, but we were just uh, surprised to learn that we, uh, we had a little small reunion from the high school from many years ago. But anyway, as far as uh, my getting involved in show business, I started when I was about seven years old. Uh, and I got in on the tail end of radio days. Uh, this was back in Toronto, Canada, where I was born. Uh, I got involved because my older brother, who was a few years older, uh, was involved in a children's dramatic group, really just for fun. There was no necessary uh, aspiration to be in show business or be, to be an actor, but it was just a, a thing that little kids were doing. And uh, I would see my brother bring the scripts home and thought this would be fun, and I was about six, seven years old. So I joined the same group, and it turned out the group was conducted by a lady who wrote and directed and produced a children's radio show, Peter and the Wolf. And uh, I started working in radio uh, at the CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in Canada. The radio <coughs> building and television buildings were right next to each other. And it wound up uh, that uh, after I, I, the, the teacher found out they were looking for a kid for a show, and I, they said, do you want to go on an audition? And suddenly I found myself working as an actor, and they were paying me to do this. And uh, next thing I know, one thing led to another, and I started doing television. And I worked uh, quite a lot doing television and radio shows from about six or seven until 10 years old, working with people that came, went on to great careers, directors, actors like Norman, actor like Norman Jewison and Arthur Hiller and Lauren Green uh, and several others that uh, came to the States. And anyway, when I was about 10 years old, I wound up auditioning for the My Friend Flicka television series, 20th Century Fox. Uh, had decided to make their first venture into television <coughs> after having been a major motion picture producer for so long. And the My Friend Flicka series was their first TV show that they were doing. And that resulted in the whole family being uprooted and moving from Toronto out to Hollywood. And we lived in the San Fernando Valley. And when the series was over, I went to well, we were in high school together, Bobby and I. We also were at college together. I never admit that to anybody, by the way. <laughs> You're the only ones that know. <laughs> Keep it under your hat. Go ahead. And we also wound up being at the same college at California State University in Northridge, home of a, a subsequent big earthquake, you may recall, many years ago. Um, after a college. That, that I didn't know. You, I, did you ever see me in college? No. I never saw him there. I didn't no. know that we went to the same college at the same time. That's right. Until, until he in mentioned me a year ago. In high school, we used to ago. see each other, but not yeah, in college, no. no. So anyway, after college, mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I went to New York because I wanted to do more theater work, which, was, which is so rewarding to an actor. So I was in New York for about 12 years, and I worked at many theaters all over the country, and I wound up while I was in New York working on several different soap operas, uh, as well as a few movies and, and, uh, and a lot of theater work, which I absolutely loved. Uh, and then I made the decision to take it even further and to take some time off and go to London, England. And I studied, decided to dig into the classics like Shakespeare. And I 
spent time in London. I went to the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art and the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. And uh, while I was over in London, I guess one of the most exciting roles that I ever performed was playing Shylock mm. in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. And after doing that, I worked in some movies. And interestingly enough, uh, I did a movie which was a true story based on an actual famous bank robbery in London, England. Uh, the movie was called A Nightingale Sang in Berkeley Square, starring David Niven and Elkie Summer and Richard Jordan and a few other people. And the interesting part was that little did I know it, but several years later I would change careers. And I guess the producer and director saw something in me that I didn't realize at that time. But I played the manager of the American bank in Berkeley Square that was robbed. And I wound up changing careers and becoming a banker, which is what I'm doing now. <laughs> <laughs> so for I was an actor for 35 years, changed careers. And now I'm a senior vice president, loan officer at a small bank, the Edgartown National Bank on Martha's Vineyard Island off the coast of Cape Cod in Massachusetts. And I enjoy my work very much. I love it. Um, I also loved being an actor. Um, I had a lot of uh, exciting experiences and met a lot of interesting people, of course. But I think uh, that's kind of a brief summation of how I got here. And I was here two years ago and had a wonderful time, and it's great to be back. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Why don't we talk a little bit about McCutcheon? McCutcheon. And Bob, you, you probably knew him as well as anybody at, during the period that, that uh, we're, we're interested here. Uh, am I wrong? I, I remember you I remember you talking almost he, long he was, as, as much about him as you talked about yourself. M McCutcheon owned Fury. I, he didn't own uh, he didn't own Flicka. But he, he would train he would the horse was trained. It wasn't uh, it wasn't a horse that necessarily did tricks. It did tricks. And the horse kind of lived with him. It didn't really just when he'd walk around, he had a place in, in Panorama City. Later he bought a big ranch up in where Disney is in Sand Canyon. But he had a, a stable of horses, a lot of horses. And this horse would just kind of, he'd go around the day, and this black horse, Beauty, would follow him around and just hang out. Sometimes it would go in the pool, and sometimes it even went in his house. And it would just, it would just hang out. And he would, he would teach, matter of fact, one time it was push, do you, do you remember this? One time, he would, he, he'd say, give him a push, Beauty, give him a push. And he'd walk up and give you a nudge and push you with, and sometimes he'd lift you right off the ground, practically. But when he did that, he also lifted up his lips, and he was going, he would push and go like that. And so you had to be kind of careful, that, you know, because he would he'd get kind of in a little snickety mood, you know, and he would kind of reach over and snap at you. But once in a while, he would do that. And one time, whether you remember this or not, he pushed Roger and grabbed his shirt and tore his shirt off. Yeah, I mean, ripped it right down because he reached up and grabbed it. And sometimes he'd, he'd kind of snip at you. But he, he would say no. He would say yes. He'd say, open your mouth, Butte. And then when he wanted him to rear up, he'd go, Butte, get up there. Get up there. You know, and he'd do it all free. The horse would work out in the open. And then he would say, you know, get on your mark. And then they'd do a scene, and he's supposed to run off. And he'd say, okay, Butte, go on, go on. And sometimes they'd have a guy way out there with a bowl of oats, you know, and he'd go, Butte, come here. And so he'd say, go on. And he'd run and, and run off to the guy with the oats. And they said, let's do that one more time. He says, that didn't come off quite right. He said, Butte, come here, get back here. He says, get back on your mark. And the horse would walk. He says, no, move over. That's it. Okay, stay. And, he, and he, the horse would get back on his mark and stay there. And he just did trick after trick. And people were just walking around. And then he'd walk off, and the horse would just follow him. You know, he, wherever the horse, he went, the horse would just follow him. And, you know, and, and in the beginning, when I, I didn't really ride that well in the beginning, that was one of those things. Well, I didn't tell you that about my mom. When, when, when I'd go out on interviews, the other thing she would say, you know, and she asked me if, you know, that they say you could do this, I said no. She says, whenever they ask you if you can do something, just say yes. We'll teach it to you later. <laughs> so when I went out on, on that part, they said, can you ride a horse? I said, yes. How well? Really well. And then later, I, you know, I got the part, quick, get on a horse. So I just had really good balance. So they would throw me up on a horse, you know, on, on beauty when, when we were first starting with no, with no reins, no nothing. And he would just call the horse way off in the distance, and I would just hang on. That was, that was riding. I'd just hang on to his mane, and this horse is flying along. So... 
uh, with McCutcheon, he had he was actually training another horse, uh, a horse called a Morgan. I forgot the horse's name now. Donnie Thunder, Rowe. Donnie oh, Rowe. Don, Donnie Rowe. That's right. Yeah. And, and they were and so they were training this other horse to take his place. Beautiful horse, big head, huge mane. And so they had this ready to go because they never knew beauty might crap out at some point. <laughs> You never knew. But McCutcheon could, he had to train dogs, train horses, but he, he, had, he could train them to the point where they would learn a trick. They, they want him to do something. I want him to go up there and, and pretend like he's undoing somebody's ropes. They're tied. Your hands are tied behind your back. They want, so he'd go, you, come here, sis. And he'd just play with him for a while. Pick it up. Pick it up. That's it. Grab it. Pick it up. So then, then he'd stand back and he'd go, beauty, go on over there. Pick it up. Pick it up. And the horse would go over there and start going like this to your, your ropes are on your hand. I mean, not that he could undo the ropes, but it looked like he was doing it. He would teach them things right on the spot. Just teach them to do a trick. And then we'd shoot the scene and he would have it. You know, it wasn't that he did tricks. One time, because he would teach him to, you get on his back. I didn't know what I was doing. He said, now just hold on to the mane. I said, okay. He said, get him up, get him up. And the horse would go, rrr, rrr. he'd go rearing up, and I'd just hang on. So, and then one time I had, one time we did it with, with I had reins in my hand, and I, and I wasn't paying attention, and all of a sudden the horse reared up, and I didn't have hold of his mane. All I had hold of was the reins. So I'm falling backwards, and I'm hanging on to these reins, and the horse is just coming over backwards, and they're yelling at me, let go of the reins, because I'm pulling on his head. And so, I mean, I said, Jesus, you know, I, and I jumped off backwards, and I turned around, and the horse is sitting down. I mean, he was just about to come over backwards on me. But he would teach him all these tricks, you know, kneel down, because I couldn't jump up on the horse in the beginning. So he would teach him to, to kneel down on his front knees, and then I could jump up easier, and then he'd say, get back up, and then he'd get back up. So it was, it was a pretty trippy guy. He had a, later he got a, he got a 50-something-odd-foot boat, and he called it the Fury, you know. And, and he would go to Catalina and back. And one time we had a little 16-foot boat, and we were going to Catalina and back, you know, putting along. This huge, massive boat of his. But uh, what else do you want to know about McCutcheon? Well, why don't we let uh, Roger, Roger sound like Roger McCutcheon. had some experiences with him. Well, they had one scene where Packy was supposed to climb a fire tower, and uh, Fury wasn't going to let him climb up there. And so they took a carrot and put it in my back pocket. And Ralph told Butte, he said, pick it up, pick it up. And he came in off stage, and instead of picking up the carrot, he picked up about three inches of my butt. <laughs> so, Yeah, that's, that's what he does. And they had... Um, for the stand-in uh, horses, the old horse was named Chick. Remember yeah. Chick? Chick, yes. And right. for the long riding scenes, yeah. the horse's name was Jet. I know you remember Jet. Yeah, Jet was, was a handful. A there was a couple horses that they yeah. used. When they had a like, long run, they didn't yeah. want to wear beauty out, so we would get on a different yeah. black horse and go for like yeah. a long run. And then they had uh, Donnie Rowe, the one that he was yeah. grooming yeah. To, to be fierce. That, that was a really neat horse. Yeah. Yeah. He, he doesn't, I just reminded him, I forgot about this. There was, what's the guy's name, the, the heavy? Lane Bradford. A guy named Lane Bradford is a name that it's a face that you would know if you saw it, because he always played a heavy in gangster movies and you know bad guys and the cowboys. And but he was a really nice guy in person. I mean, you know, in life. But in one scene, he was supposed to he's going to shoot Fury, and and Roger was supposed to go, no, don't do that. And he had a rifle in his hand, and he and he'd go like that and throw Roger over to the side. You know, so we practiced it a few times, and then came the scene, and he grabbed this, and Roger went jumping up, and he said, no, don't shoot him, and he threw Roger off, and Roger didn't go flying off like he's supposed to. He seemed to be hanging on to something, and so the guy the guy went like that a few times. And, and it, what it turned out is that the handle that you pull back to cock the gun got stuck in Roger's elbow. And he was going like this, and Roger was just <laughs> hanging on, and it literally tore a, a big V in his arm. Good. It's still there. <laughs> All these 48 years. stitches. Yeah. I was and back at work the next morning the at 6 o'clock. put it back in work, and they just did nothing, but he did all his scenes standing behind a pole, standing behind a car, standing you know, His arm was behind something for the rest of the scenes. So. Poor Lane Bradford felt so bad, didn't he? God. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Well, I guess I know why I got replaced. The horse hit the marks better than I did. I remember Fury quite well. Apparently... That one trick was well honed because Fury was supposed to push me, and they put a carrot in my back pocket, and Fury ripped out the back of my jeans. <laughs> I was air conditioned. Maybe it was his jeans, and not your shirt. And then, and then, face. and then once I was bareback on Fury with Bobby, Bobby got to hold on to the mane. You got to hold on to Bobby. <laughs> and the horse did its rear, and I slid right off the back end. My horse's name was Pokey. 
I thought they should have had a, a series called Pokey. <laughs> Possibly Pokey and Pee Wee. <laughs> and I didn't learn to ride until I got the part. I didn't have to lie. They never asked the question. But you'll notice in Fury, you never see me get on or off a horse. I was so short I couldn't do it. <laughs> so there was always a cut, and someone threw me on the horse. And then they started cameras again. And I'm either on or off, but never in transition. Uh, but, but Fury was a great horse to watch. And I remember, was it, was it Jet? Was that the name of the horse that ran? Jet, yeah. And he would do those long distance running scenes and they always had four or five wranglers to try and catch him afterwards because he didn't want to come back. Right. <laughs> Did McCutcheon train all the horses? Yeah. They were all from his stable. Yeah. Right. He, he had a white one at one point. I, I never saw him do this, but everybody, a number of the Wranglers did. He had a white one where the horse would stick his head between McCutcheon's legs and flip him up, and he'd land in the saddle behind him. Uh, it was a great trick. It was when McCutcheon was younger, and, but that was one of the things that he taught. He could teach horses just about anything. Anything a horse could do, he could teach it to him. My first day on the set, they brought uh, my horse to me, which is, was lucky in the show, but his name was Stove Legs. And... Uh, the Wrangler brought him over. You remember Ivan? Sure. Ivan brought his voice and says, there's your horse, kid. Uh, climb aboard. <laughs> and I'm like, how? <laughs> and I had lied, too. I had told them I knew how to ride. And uh, so Ivan has a fit, and uh, he tells the director, Ray Nazaro, who didn't want me in the first place, and he has a fit, and he's just, and Ralph Black, the assistant director, he's trying to protect me, and Nazaro's just going ballistic. This little SOB can't ride. Why, you lie to us, you little SOB. I didn't want you in the first place. And I'm eight years old. <laughs> and, uh, and Peter Graves is standing there, and Bill Fawcett and Bobby, they're like, hey, this little SOB can't ride. What's, <laughs> what's up? That's not true. And <laughs> Ralph McCutcheon had a wrangler named uh, Hank Myers. So Myers comes up to Nazari and said, I think I got a plan. He said, I got a niece that's eight years old, and she can ride. Get her out here. Within an hour, this little eight-year-old girl with hair down her back shows up. They put her in a packy shirt. Makeup man takes the scissors and cuts her hair. Out, and she rode for me uh, until I got the hang of it. So, but I thought I was so scared. My mom was scared. We thought they were just going to send us home. And, uh, Didn't uh, uh, Johnny have a girl doubling him? Yes. As a matter of fact, I must say that. Uh, me, me too. <laughs> Steffi Epper. Stephanie Epper. The Eppers. The whole family of stunt people. Yes. The first, just the first year. Yeah. Uh, the, the Epper family was famous in Hollywood, as Bobby mentioned. Uh, her, the father, John Epper, used to double for Gary Cooper and a lot Elvis of others. Uh, I, I had a girl, Stephanie Epper. They cut her hair short and dyed it red. And uh, You're kidding. She was on the series the whole time. And we had, had a, an Epper story. We had a great time of talking about training of horses and everything. Uh, the writers would get carried away sometimes, and sometimes you would actually read in the script where, you know, the, the, the direction was that Flicka says something, and Flicka looks at Ken bewilderedly. <laughs> <coughs> that was a tough one, but they had a lot of, <laughs> they had a lot of high expectations for Flicka. They thought they were writing for Fury. He could have done it. <laughs> Bob, you said you, you had something you wanted to add about. Uh, uh, well, St Stephanie Epper was a little little, well, was a little skinny girl at the at the time. It looked like a little boy. She had short hair, and she the first year of Fury, she on big big rides, you know, heavy duty rides. She would she would do the stunts. Then later, when they had another kid on the show, then I would do my own riding, and she'd double the other kid. <clears throat> then after a while, I started doing my own riding. But they had horses at their house. They had a family. This is a family. Uh, it was Johnny Epper was the father. They had a daughter named Margo Epper, Jeannie Epper. There was a Gary Epper, Andy Epper, and Steffi Epper, and they were all stunt people. And John Epper doubled pretty much everybody. On Love Me Tender, he did Elvis Presley. Uh, Jeannie Epper is the Stunt Women's Association president now. Now they've all got kids, and their kids have got kids. And they're all, whenever you see a Western, you will see the Epper, E-P-P-E-R. E -P -P -E so I used to sit there, and I, I, when I was married, I, when we'd go to a movie or something, I'd say, oh, look, there's Gary Epper, Andy Epper, look, there's Margo Epper. I'd say, you know, then I'd tell my, my ex-wife, you know, the, the story of Stephanie Epper and the Epper family. And I used to go to horse shows, and we'd all go together. I'd go to their house, we'd grab horses, and we'd all ride to horse shows, these Jim Cannas, and we'd compete. I, I was always using somebody else's horse. 
<clears throat> and 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 at one point in time, you know, when I start to, she's my my ex-wife would say, I know, I know, it's the Eppers, I know, I know. <laughs> she didn't, didn't want to hear any more stories about the Eppers. I got it, the Eppers. <laughs> so one time, we're we're sitting in a, a deli in Woodland Hills, and right around the corner from my office, and this big gal comes over and she says, Are you Bobby Diamond? I said, yeah, and my wife was sitting there, and she says, I'm Stephanie Epper. I said, see, see, <laughs> Stephanie Epper. And then, and then one time we were, oh, God, I can't remember the name. of it. It's, it's, a fa it's a famous Western movie they shot in New Mexico about 12, 13, 14 years ago. Oh, God. God, it was a classic. And, and sure enough, we w I was skiing there, and I went out to eat, and, and it was in the same area they were shooting this movie, and God knows about three or four of the Eppers were all on this show, but... In terms of the Epper family, it's a famous family of stunt people, and you, could, you will not see a Western, even to this day, where you don't see about three or four of their names up on there. The, the kid, the, the parents, the gra kids, the grandkids. They're all, they're, all, they're all still stunt people, breaking their bones, jumping off of horses. <laughs> all right, let's go to the audience now. See anybody got questions they want to direct? When I was three, uh, my folks put me in the trio with my brother and sister, and uh, and I forgot to mention this a while ago. It's in real life. My name's our last name is Mobley, but uh, the Fury people said, you know, we really need to start repronouncing your name. We don't like the sound of Mobley, so from now on, you're Roger Mobley. So in in Hollywood out there, I'm Roger Mobley, but in real life, it's it's Mobley. And uh, when my grandmother died here 20 years ago, one of her last words to me she says. You always a mobly, you always will be a mobly. <laughs> so, yes, Grandma. Fifty-five so. years later, he tells me his name's Mobley instead of Mobley. <laughs> but I started writing uh, cowboy songs. I think it was uh, 1982 or three. I wrote the first one, a, a tribute to my idol, Roy Rogers, and uh, that kind of got me started writing cowboy songs. And I'll be doing some of them tonight at the pool. Thank you for mentioning that. Bill Foster was a great guy. Yeah, he was in. I don't think they made a western without him or Gabby Hayes in it. It was. You had to have an old. You had to have an old coot, and it was either him or Gabby. So he'd play some of the roles with his teeth in, and some of the roles with his teeth out. He was actually. He was actually an English teacher before he became an actor, and he was. So he's a really bright guy. He had a lot of interesting. You know, when you're off off the set, you could sit there and just talk to him for hours. He was. He was a good guy. He was a, one of the nicer people around. Really and, unoffensive. Yeah. And as a him. as a kid, I could cry on cue, but I couldn't laugh. At the end of every Fury episode, there's always this little comedic end where everybody stands around looking at Fury laughing, and I couldn't do it. Everybody else is giving us good laugh, and I'm going, hey. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Fawcett would take me off to the side and try to teach me how to stage laugh, and I never got it. So, so there's five of us laughing and one guy crying. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you know we were in movies? Who else was in a movie with Audie Murphy? Not me. No kidding. To hell and back. Artie Murphy was my hero. <laughs> I didn't know him. Really? Yeah. Well, I didn't know you then. No. Uh, I never met him. I played, we played it when they were little. We played when he was a little kid and somebody else played, yeah. I forget, Gordon something. Gordon something know. played the part of, the only thing I remember about that trip is we went to Bakersfield and we were at a table with a bunch of kids and we were all ordering dinner and, you know, dinner was obviously paid for by them and, and one kid ordered a hamburger and that kid ordered a hamburger and a hamburger and he got to me and I said, yeah, I want a hamburger too. My mom said, hey, you can get a hamburger anytime. <laughs> get a steak. <laughs> Y'all yeah, would have to know his mom, Pearl. <laughs> yeah. So, so that was that was what I learned on the Audie Murphy show. But the, to Helen back was the name of the movie, and I, I never actually met Audie Murphy because I was playing him. He was uh, about a 16-year-old, 15-year-old kid, and it was played by a kid named Gordon something. He played Audie, and then I played one of his younger brothers. Yeah, and I played an even younger brother. Was it even younger? Is that what it was? Yeah, we had pancakes and a scene for breakfast. That's all he remembers? <laughs> pancakes. Well, we and ate pancakes well, what kind of for, syrup? for about it. nine hours. <laughs> now I understand. I don't know if there was divorce rates and stuff were going up in 1955. I think it's a little after that when it really started cooking. But, uh, yeah, there was, everything was family values during that time. It was always, it was never cussing. You couldn't even show, you couldn't even mention going to the bathroom. You couldn't show two people sleeping in a bed. You couldn't, it was a lot of yeah. things that they, they wouldn't show then. So it was a little unrealistic in some ways. I think even Ozzy and Harry, whatever, slept in separate bed. Everybody was, yeah. nobody we, slept together. We had an episode one time where Lee Van Cleef had robbed a bank. 
and he was holding us hostage in. Uh, Did we work with Lee Van Cleef? Yeah. And Damn. <laughs> and he had a. He was doing a scene pointing the gun at uh, Bobby and I. Son and gun. somebody stepped in and said, "You can't do that. You can't point guns at kids." So he had to do it away from us. Yeah, I remember that. God, I Your Lee sentiments Van Cleef. are something. Sir, that I've heard echoed many, many times. Oftentimes, uh, people have come up and expressed the thoughts about the difference between the writing and the shows that were prevalent then compared to today. It's true, I suppose. Yes, it really is. <laughs> Actually, you want to hear something kind of strange? And I was in. Um, I, I did a personal appearance in. In uh, God, where the hell was I? Cleveland or Ohio or something? No, Milwaukee. I'm sorry, it's Milwaukee. And and and. I was at a, a Milwaukee State Fair, and there was Jan and Dean were there, and Irish McCalla, Sheena, Queen of the Jungle. And we were on a radio show, and they were asking questions. You know, I was just kind of, my mind just kind of wanders around. I was about 18. And they were asking Irish McCall about her relationship with the great white hunter, you know, Sheena. And he says, well, we didn't have much of a relationship. You know, we were just friends, and there wasn't really any kind of, you know, th anything going on. And it went on and on and on. And finally, they got to me, and they said, hey, Bobby, how, how are you doing? And I said, I said, I want to tell you one thing. I said, me and the horse had a much better relationship <laughs> than Irish McCall <laughs> and the great white hunter, and I got banned from radio. <laughs> just radio. No more radio in Milwaukee. And then, then later... Later, the, though you never would have thought of it in 1955, later, I forgot where it came up, but several times they talked about whether or not my relation, the fact that I was living in a house with two men and no women, <laughs> they started talking about this being a homosexual relationship. I said, wow, I never saw that one coming. But, <laughs> but in 1955, that never would have even occurred to you. But nowadays, you would think about, you know, oh, wait a minute, that's kind of odd that an adult adopts a young boy, you know, male, you know, geez. My father, just, we, we, I had a stuntman uh, in, in later years named Whitey Hughes, who was r really, has he, has he really, right. he, just, he just passed away about a year ago, year and a half, and I was at his funeral, and matter of fact, there was one story about, because Whitey was a feisty guy, I mean, I, you know, you may not have known this, but he was only about five foot five, but he was just like hard as a rock, always, I mean, he could be 70 years old, you grab his arms, you go, Jesus! You know, because he, he was always water skiing and push-ups and whatever, and he was kind of a tough guy. I mean, he was pretty, you know, you, you wouldn't want to push Whitey around because he, he wouldn't take it. And he was on the show Wild Wild West with Robert Conrad, and Robert Conrad really was, you know, really held himself up as a boxer and a karate guy, and he did karate, and except that Whitey actually was tough. I mean, he really was tough. As a matter of fact, so Ed hit, and, and I'd heard a story, and I heard it from several people, so I knew it was true. Well, one time they were at a bar, and, you know, afterwards, after shooting the show, they went into some bar, and, and uh, Robert Conrad was there, and Whitey was there, and his wife, uh, Dorothy, and I, I think his brother might have been there. And I, I can't remember what, how the story went, why, but Robert Conrad got up, made some kind of a comment, and Whitey said, hey, you know, watch it. And Robert Conrad gave him a push or, or hit him or something, and Whitey decked him. You know, and Whitey was the kind of guy that would go into a bar, and, and next thing you know, there's like a brawl, and he's beating the crap out of everybody, guys twice his size. But, I mean, there's enough stories that you know that it's true, and if you're ever around him, he was a really nice guy, but, I mean, I wouldn't want to screw with him. So, uh, so then here we are at Whitey's, they had a memorial, and Robert, and I didn't recognize who it was at first. The guy got up, you know, everybody got up and said a little something, I got up and said a little something, and this guy got up and he says, I have hired Whitey Hughes. Yeah. And I've fired Whitey Hughes. I've fought with Whitey Hughes. <laughs> and he went on and on. And as I was realizing, I said, oh, my God, that's Robert Conrad. And so then when I got up to speak, I said, you know, I always wanted to hear the details of the little punch out because I never heard quite how it was. And, and, and he told one story about Whitey Hughes. He says he wanted somebody to get up on the, you know, at a bar, at a saloon on the second floor and to dive off and land on a table. And then stuntman said, well, we'll put some boxes. He says, no, no. He says, I want them just to land on a table. He says, well, I'm not going to do that. You know, stuntmen set up their projects. They don't just dive off into the air and land on something. And he says, well, get Whitey. So Whitey goes, says, Whitey, I want you to get up on the second floor and dive off and land on this table. He says, okay. And he, he just goes right up and dives off and lands on a table and then gets up and walks away. He did a stunt on Fury where he was, it was, 
doubling me, but he's supposed to run and go under a branch and hit a branch and get, knock him off. And then I'm supposed to lay you know, unconscious for, you know, for a day or so, you know, and then, oh, God, please, Joey, come back. You know, <laughs> Fury comes in, please, Joey, come back. But Whitey, to do the stunt, you'd think, you know, there was some kind of a thing pulling. No, Whitey rode a horse right into a branch, you know. <laughs> And the branch knocked him off, and he had a big cut across his head. Nice shot, Whitey, and then go to the next shot. But that's how Whitey Hughes did a shot. But I forgot why the hell I started that story. But. Yeah, you were talking about airborne. Oh. Actually, he wasn't. Uh, no, no, no. Whitey, Whitey, Hughes, Whitey Hughes, the reason I, Whitey Hughes made a movie on his own. He produced a movie. That got my dad interested in, hey, let's produce a movie. So they got a guy together named James Landis who, who, got, who got that script, and Whitey Hughes helped my dad put that together and we all went to Fayetteville, North Carolina, the 82nd Airborne, and, and boy, they got stuff done at this, you know, they got these guys with us and, and we got, we got uh, oh, Captain Bassiano and, and we had this whole group of 82nd Airborne guys going with us wherever we went and we just kept, we made this movie called Airborne. We got a better write-up than uh, Hell is for Heroes, you know, which is a big A movie and we got a better, but we, I'm not sure if we ever made any money off it. Y'all notice he said at Whitey Hughes' memorial, he said a little something. You believe that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe I spoke for a few minutes more. <laughs> the relationship between the characters in your show, in each individual show, how would you characterize that? I don't were know. you good friends or were oh, you no, we, adversaries? Yeah. Oh, no, no. And things no, of that no. no, we've always been friends. No, I, I, we're friendly yeah. rivals. We really are. Uh, like I say, we were in high school together. I mean, of course, if we are, we're up for the same part, and I thought it was close. You got to do what you got to do, you know. <laughs> no, uh, we uh, we had when we were you know back doing the series, we we hung out together. We, a lot of the kids that were actors uh, would go to parties together and. Uh, we had a lot of fun. We were all good friends. I so. was at his brother's, what is it, before you get married, the bachelor party. I was at his, that was my first bachelor party. Yeah, okay, okay. I don't remember that much more about it other than I was there. <laughs> I mean, once, after the sixth or seventh drink, who can remember anything, really? It was a long, long time ago, is but. That who's in that photo? Yeah, that's, I that couldn't, couldn't remember the name. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was Richard Conti, yeah. But, but a very nice man. Just a very nice man is what I remember about him. Uh, very kind, very, very, uh, you know, people had to be nice to me. They didn't want to make me cry. <laughs> but a very nice man. That brings back memories, Ray. Uh, I, when, I, when I was under contract at 20th Century Fox, uh, they put me in a few of those 20th Century Fox Hour shows, I, and they're exactly what you mentioned. One remake was Laura, which of course was a famous film. Another was in times like these. So there were a few of those uh, one hour 20th Century Fox shows I did, yeah. Joy, my wife Joy is here this today. Uh, we have one child, a boy, he's 31. Uh, I think I made it quite clear to our son Luke as he was growing up how challenging and difficult show business is. And uh, I never did encourage him to go into show business. I mean, as much as I loved it, I sincerely loved it. I loved being an actor uh, 35 years, you know, and if you're not in a TV series like we have done, uh, w all of us have worked as we've, as it's been brought out here today in various uh, guest appearances in TV shows, but people don't remember you as well as when you're on TV in the same show every week, of course. But I've made it clear to my son, I guess, uh, that yes, there are the ups and downs, as we all know, with show business. And I never encouraged him. Uh, the only thing he ever did was a, uh, a high school play at one time. And he's off in, a, in another career at the moment uh, in related to computers. But uh, I think he understands. He's heard my stories as much as... It's those stories that discouraged him from ever <laughs> having to hear the same story over and over. <laughs> Well, my stories were never as long as oh. your stories. <laughs> oh. He, oh, he got the point rather quickly. <laughs> I didn't have to go on and on. <laughs> we're still friends. No, we're not. <laughs>
<laughs> it ended right there. Okay. <laughs> no, he was he was he was a super guy. You know, when I was on the show originally, I was just a little kid, so it was hard to relate that much to an adult. He was just always a good guy to me. Matter of fact, at, at 16, as I was getting my license, they, in those days they weren't as picky about the unions, and they would let him drive his car instead of insisting on the drivers driving him. So he had a 52 Ford, and I'd go, Peter, can I take the car? <laughs> He'd give me the keys. Liability wasn't as much an issue, and I'd go peeling around, driving around all the different sets, you know, have gun will travel on, on the Iverson Ranch. So uh, then, then uh, God, I'm trying to think how long ago, six, seven, eight, nine years ago, give or take, they roasted Peter Graves over at Sportsman's Lodge, and they had, and they, and I was on the days with um, Mike Mannix or Mike, Mike Connors, who played Mannix, and um, oh God, all the people from uh, Peter Lupus, all the all the people on on Mission Impossible, uh, oh the guy that did. Um, this is your life. I forgot his name. Ralph, Ralph, Ralph Edwards. Ralph Edwards. But I mean, it was a whole whole group of people, and and I mean, we just had a great time, you know, screwing with Peter on his. I mean, who was who was the one that was married to Barbara? Martin Landau and Barbara and Barbara Bain. And at this point in time, they were separated, getting a divorce. He still liked her, but she was pissed as crap because he was dating he was dating some twenty year old or something. And so she, they so when we first got there, she wouldn't be in the same room with him. So she would be in a different room, and when we sat at the table, she sat at one end of the table, and he sat at the other. But you could see he still got a kick when she smoked. He just sat there and was laughing at everything she said because he still enjoyed her, but she was still pissed about getting a divorce and the whole thing. But but he we we did a I did you know I just wrote a bunch of little bits down. I'd never got up in front of an audience of what about eight or nine hundred people in this place, and uh, and so I just wrote a bunch of bits down. I'm thinking to myself, you know, what if I'm sitting here talking and nobody laughs? I said, well, I said, you know, I'll just talk for a while, look around, and go, well, good luck, Peter, and sit down. <laughs> but when I started going, I mean, he just had the place in stitches, and everybody, was, his wife was sitting at a table in the front, and she was pounding the table with her fist, and I was talking about, you know, how, oh, it, just, it was one thing after the other. I said, you know, they talk about Peter, you know, in a drinking problem. I said, yeah, it's not true. I said, on Fury set, Peter, you could never see, Peter never drank alcohol on the, TV, on the Fury TV set before 9 o'clock. He never started before 9 <laughs> And then about women on the set, I just kept going going and going about, about the fact that Peter was always really neat. You know, whenever you see him, I mean, his hat's on, his shirt's always pressed, his pants are just tailored, and, and me, my shirt's hanging out, you know, my pants are unzipped half the time, and they're always telling me, Bobby, tuck in your pants, pull up your pants, pull in this, tuck that. He said, look at Peter, look at Peter. They're always saying, look at Peter. I said, well, you know, I'm looking at him. I don't know how he looks like that all the time. So, so Peter took me aside and says, Bobby, he says, you want to tuck in your shirt, you unzip your pants and you stick your hand in, and you pull your shirt down from the inside. I said, oh, thanks, you know. So, I, so when I was doing it, you know, he didn't tell me, don't do this when everybody's looking, because you, you know, you're like this. And everybody, I said, thanks, Peter. So it went on and on and on, and finally, I, you know, at the very end, I said, well, I got every, everything I have, I owe to Peter. I want to thank him. And I said, what, and what I am right now is I'm an attorney. I said, thanks, Peter. And, Sat down. But then Peter got up at the very end, you know, and everybody had commented about how clean he always looked, how dapper he always looked, how his clothes are always so perfectly pressed. So when he got up, he looked around, stood up, ruffled his hair, took off his shirt, ripped off his tie, took off his jacket, and then said there, and then started talking. But, and then afterwards, afterwards, he gave me a call. I hadn't seen him, oh, God, I don't know, 20, 30 years. And he gave me a call and said, Bobby, he says, damn, he says, that was funny. And so we sat there and talked for a while. And, and last year, I was supposed to call him to see if he wanted to go to North Carolina, and I kept making a note called Peter Graves. And, and I kept the note around, and finally, a guy named Mike Marks from the other, from the place in Salem, Oregon, or Salem, uh, North Carolina, he says, Bobby, did you call him yet? I said, no, no. I said, okay, I'll write another note. And I wrote a note, and then I went over to the TV and looked, and Peter Graves died. I said, oh, God. So now when I write a note about calling somebody, I call him right away. I don't wait. You never know. So, Gene Evans is the gentleman who played my father on the My Friend Flicka series, and I know that he has been to this festival many times and was a great favorite of a lot of people, as well as me. Uh, I regret terribly that uh, life didn't lead us together again and we you know didn't happen to be here at the same time I uh, I had I hadn't seen Gene Evans since the Flicka series he was my favorite on the show we got along great Gene Evans was always a cut up always playing practical jokes he'd be out there in the 115 degree weather in Malibu Canyon where 20th Century Fox owned a lot of land and did a lot of location shooting 
and he would always arrange to get the crew to turn on the fire hose when we were, everybody was quite hot uh, and uh, turn the fire hose on and shoot it up in the air and everybody could get soaked except the actors, of course. We couldn't because we were filming. Uh, but like I say, he was uh, just a marvelous gentleman. He did a wonderful thing for me. The uh, uh, I used to save all of my scripts and make little doodle marks and everything. And uh, one day I was talking to Gene and he mentioned how, oh yeah, he said, I used to save things too. And he said it just gets to be too much and he just stopped being a collector and saving all this stuff. So I went to my mom and said, you know, I don't think I should save these scripts anymore. Once we're done with them, I'm done with them. You know, I decided I'll do the same as Gene. So my mom uh, was in cahoots with Gene Evans with a plan to save these scripts so she would get all my scripts when the series ended that uh, uh, Gene Evans got all the scripts from my mom, had them all bound in three leather-bound volumes and had printed on them my friend Flicka series and my name and everything and gave them to me as a Christmas gift. It was just an indication of how thoughtful he was. And I know that he was a favorite here. Uh, and I used to hear that he would regale people with many, s I'm sure he couldn't compete with you, no, Bob. No, no, no. <laughs> but. Uh, but he had a lot of great stories I heard and uh, kept people laughing and uh, having a good time here at, at prior festivals. So I, I did, I do miss Gene Evans and I wish he were here now. Yeah. I went there for an interview when I was 13 or 14 for uh, one of their wonderful wor World of Color episodes, uh, the, uh, Love of Willa Dean, with Mike McGreevy and Billy Moomy and John Anderson. And uh, then I got the part of Gustav on uh, Emil and the Detectives, and they flew me to West Berlin for four and a half months. And that was when, when they were doing some screenings, that was when Mr. Disney saw it. And he had been trying to develop this Gallagher series, and he told his son-in-law, I think we found our Gallagher. And uh, so I, I worked at the Disney lot for all through my high school years. And they were nice enough to let me go to high school and play football and run track. And uh, they just filmed during the summertime. But it was, uh, I mean, working there was just amazing. It was absolutely wonderful. Unlike any other uh, set experience I ever had. Thank you. I've got a quick question I'd like to ask. Did any of, the, any of you guys uh, over the cr length of the series make suggestions for storylines that might have been picked up and incorporated into a script? Did that happen on any of these? No, but I think a lot of us may agree that we sometimes think that maybe not actual, actually, but we felt they had the same writers at times. You know, you watch the Lassie, I, the Lassie show, and a lot of these, and the storylines sometimes were so similar it made you think they had the same writers. But I never actually proposed they did have any. the same writers. <laughs> a lot of the same writers. There'd be a fire show on Fury, a fire show on Flick, a fire show on Lassie, a fire show where there's a fire and a horse goes in and saves you, a horse, dog goes in and saves you, a horse goes in. Flick almost goes yeah. blind, <coughs> you know, a lot of tear similar, jerkers. Similar stuff. Or they were just stealing from each other and who knows. Yeah. And then I've got one last question and we're going to close this off. I think we're running out of time here. Uh, you mentioned your fond memories of Ray Nazaro as a director. I would like to know if any of you have anything to remember about Les Cylinder who did, oh, sure. who was one of the great directors of Westerns and did many, many uh, Hopalong Cassidy's and Tim Holtz and things in films and then went into television. And I know he did a number of episodes of. <coughs> we, we had a director, Les, what was the last name? Sealander. Sealander, yeah. No. I never worked with him. No, no there was a guy named Les, uh, there was a director, Les, Les, and he taught at Cal State University Northridge later. Mm -hmm. I, I never had him, but I uh -huh. saw his name. Oh, God. We may have had him. A we had Earl Bellamy for a Earl couple. Bellamy, I think we Earl. did have that we guy he's talking guy about. Les, it wasn't Sealander, it was really? something else. I, I don't remember. Ah. Okay. Well, Ray, Ray Nazar, you want to hear a, a union story? You, you wonder about unions. <clears throat> One time they were doing a shot where they, they had a cart, you know, and they were rolling the cart with the camera down this track. And then all of a sudden, you know, and they're shooting, and all of a sudden, the thing goes over uh, one of the cords was going across. So, you know, the guy with the electrician would walk over and move the cord out of the way. And they start to try the shot again. And they're rolling back, you know, and, and it hit the cord. They said, well, guys, why don't you just hold the cord? Well, the 
it's an electrician job, and the electrician's on this light over here. I want to, you know, he's doing something else. So they did it a couple times, kept hitting this cord. So finally, Ray Nazaro said, here, I'll hold the damn thing. And he walked over, and they picked up the cord, and half the set walked away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody who didn't have a card, you he went for another job. <laughs> you got that, that was it was a union thing. They, they, you can't touch that. Yeah. Only guy with a certain card can touch that cord. And anybody else touched that cord, the other guys would support the union position, and they would walk, they wouldn't do the yeah. job unless everybody did the union job. That's why non-union jobs don't have those problems. You got to tell them the lion story right quick. Oh, oh, oh that, we, did a, we did a show that had to do with a, a circus in town. Uh, Paul Paterni played a lion tamer, <clears throat> and, and the lion escaped. And, and, uh, and Ray Nazaro was the director. Ray Nazaro, was in, if you didn't know, was about five foot two or five foot three. I mean, even I towered over him, and I'm, you know, <clears throat> hey, Ray, how are you? <clears throat> so we had that they, they brought a real lion on the set. And at one point, Roger Mobley, not Roger Mobley, Roger Mobley was supposed to, we're looking for the lion, and Roger walks over and sits on a rock, and he's sitting there, and the lion comes up behind him. So they built a cage, and they put brush around the cage, and the front of the cage was a sheet of glass, you know, thick glass. I forget how thick, but supposedly thick. And they're setting up the scene, and they got the, the lions in a cage, and they put the lion into this cage that's got the sheet of glass, and they said, Roger, sit over here in front of it. And Roger says, I don't want to sit there. He says, no, it's okay. He says, he says so he's sitting there, and the lion growls, and Roger says, well, well, I'm going to sit over here for a while. And Ray says, it's okay. He says, look, he says, we've got a big sheet of glass there. I mean, within... 10 seconds or five seconds, the lion started running towards the glass and went right through it. We're, I had an eight millimeter camera on me. I was sitting up there, and the first guy up the tree was Paul Paterni, the lion tamer. He, was, he went up the tree. I was sitting there, and the lion came out and had this startled look on his face. And was so he didn't see the glass. He just ran to an open space and hit the glass, and it shattered. And Roger was standing over a little bit away. And then the lion just turned and just ran away from everything. And I had the camera. So I started running the camera. And I'm running it, and my camera's going up and down. The, the, the lion's butt's going up and down. And all they did was they, they rolled out the cage, you know, out to where he, approximately where he was. They opened up the cage, and he just ran back in the cage. So, but I mean, this lion broke loose. So later we did the scene, we did the scene where he sat on a rock and they had a screen behind him and they project a projection of a, of a lion, a movie of a lion. So, but I actually have that film someplace. Well, let's uh, give, a, give these gentlemen a nice round of applause. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. And hope you have a wonderful weekend. We're looking forward to being able to visit with you individually. Thank you.